next question. If you could replace any abilities in the game, what would they be? I don't know. So the, I would replace any active passives, meaning any like uh, Taronda. She has like a, is it a cold shot on her bow that you can like toggle on and off? I would replace all of those within a more active ability, like a one time frost arrow that like freezes them in place for a couple seconds and, and then has a cooldown rather than like an auto on that uses mana. Like I hated all the passive abilities that, that um, were auto shots that used mana. They're not fun to use. It kind of diminishes the hero a bit and they could easily be reworked into uh, some sort of active ability. Yeah, any passive main ability I would rework into uh, an active that you have to like think about and use in some fashion. Uh, what work did you do on WoW? Wow, what work did I do in World of Warcraft? I think the best thing to do here would be to show you my list of things I did. Work specifics, here we go. Okay, for World of Warcraft, see I actually kept a, a detailed list. Actually, it looks like I haven't done anything. I haven't updated this. I started to update it for Wasteland 3 and I gave up. Uh, anyways, on World of Warcraft, uh, I did Whizbang Crank Toggle and the Buzzbox quests. Tokrin Pathseeker, Cargill Battlescar, and the Conscription Quests, Sergra Darkthorn in her quest series, Darsok Swift Dagger and the Harpy Quests, Ilyana and her quest series, which I think is in Ashenvale, Delgrin the Purifier, Battlefield Shadow Strike, and the Tower of Althalax quests. I think most of those were destroyed. So yeah, those are the main quest lines I did. Uh, I think between them all, there's like 30 some quests. But the most common one that people have actually experienced is the Sarika Darkthorn quest, where she's sending you around the crossroads to sort of learn the area. The interesting thing about that quest line, I don't even know if this link works anymore. Let's see. Oh, it does. Yeah. yeah there's like 12 quests in this series. The interesting thing about Sarika Darkthorn is that the when I first wrote these quests, she had different dialogue if you were a male or female character. If you were a female character, she would like praise you and talk about how great it is that you're in the Horde. And if you're a male character, she'd basically call you a, a lazy piece of shit. <laughs> and uh, that was done on purpose because I wanted to get people in the crossroads talking. So like people, people would be like, why is Sarah Darkthorn such a piece of crap? Why is she so mean to me? <laughs> and then other people would be like, what do you mean? She's awesome to me. And the difference would be that if you were a female character, she would be praising you. And if you were a male character, she'd be talking trash. So yeah. Um, that that's just something I remembered. Uh, on the Whizbang Crank Toggle uh, Buzzbox quests, the buzz boxes were people's birthdays from the Warcraft 3 development team, but I think they changed them. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, Kaplan changed them out of spite to remove them, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not sure. Good times. What games have you been working on currently or recently? Currently, I'm working on a lot of mobile games. So there's one for a Chinese studio called Everlegion. I'm writing all of the story for that, and they're gonna update that. I think they're planning to do it before Christmas. So if you wanted to catch some new dialogue, I guess you could grab that. I think it's in limited release. I think you'd have to be in Taiwan or to open the store in Taiwan to get that game. The last big game I worked on was Wasteland 3, uh, where I wrote a lot of dialogue for Fish Lips and a lot of the random encounters uh, that you can get get into roaming the the wasteland and a lot of radio stories and I did a lot of writing for the secret Santa area which uh, is really really funny um, so yeah a lot of my dark humor stuff is in wasteland 3 most recently there's a lot of nft games that I'm sort of advising for but none of them are in a state where you can do anything with them so it's not really <laughs> not really something you can play i did make geek words a while ago it's on the steam store now it used to be a mobile app but i had to take it down because the there's a bug with the server and i couldn't fix it so i had to take that down unfortunate but oh well uh, but you could purchase the game of thrones a series of puzzles for geek words these are crossword puzzles that are tied to the episodes of the tv shows and this is a secret if you buy geek words now within the next year we're planning to update and put all the puzzles back in there's over a thousand puzzles for various tv shows like um the walking dead and all the marvel shows that were on netflix like uh punisher and stuff so if you buy it now 
when we put in all those puzzles, we're going to raise the price. So secret hot tip. If you get it on Steam now, you can get it at the reduced uh, price. It, the price is currently based on just having Game of Thrones puzzles. What are your thoughts about Frost Giant Games and Dreamhaven? Do they have a good shot of creating good RTSs in the future? Why didn't you join your colleagues at these companies? Well, I have a history of outspokenness. <laughs> I'm not uh, saying that I won't ever join them. I am saying that it might be difficult for me to join them right now because a lot of these studios are just starting up and like the way that they remember me is for my level design. So they don't know about all my skills and narrative design and, and uh, system design. And like, they just don't know that I have those skill sets, <clears throat> which is fine. They've got people for that already. So I would be a, a third wheel in that regard. But there, that's not saying that I wouldn't join if they presented the opportunity in the future. My thoughts about Dreamhaven. Uh, I think the concept is really good. The idea of basically forming an umbrella, a haven for dreams, if you will, to protect studios from the harsh realities of finding venture capital and dealing with all of the legal legalities of, of running a company. I think that's a really good concept and I'm glad that Mike Morheim did that. In terms of Frost Giant, I know several of the people there and I have very good faith in them as uh, creators and I think that they will make a great RTS and that is clearly their goal is to make a, the next uh, big RTS. So I have a lot of faith in that and that's why I've been pushing people to go to frostgiant.com and subscribe so that you can see what, what comes up when they have something to show. So I'd say they have a good shot. I think that the concept for Dreamhaven is, is great and I hope that they are all very successful and uh, maybe I'll join them in the future, I don't know. What do you think about remasters, re-releases of games? Do they have merit above economic gain to a company? Um, yeah, I think a remaster isn't necessarily a bad concept. It's just that it has to be done in the right way. So the right way is simply either you just focus on it being an update uh, graphical of graphical content to catch it up. Like StarCraft is a great example of that. They did that flawlessly in my opinion. It was simply, we're just updating the graphics so that when you play in high resolution, it doesn't look like total trash. But like it was an 800 by 600 game. Like if you go back and you try to play it on like a, a modern monitor, like a 4K monitor, it just looks like utter garbage. And uh, I always felt bad when I went to Korea to visit, uh, like I was watching StarCraft matches being played on TV because that's how prolific it is. It was there maybe still is and it just looked like trash because, <laughs> because it was all pixelated and gross so yeah that's sort of like a perfect remaster example the thing is whatever you're doing with it like if you're remastering something and re-releasing it uh do something make make it clear what you're doing and then deliver on that that's that's all you really have to do reforge didn't have to end up the way it did if they had just delivered what they promised but they they didn't Let's not get into that. What do you think about MOBAs being invented indirectly through Warcraft 3? What made Dota so appealing? I think it's awesome. I think that War Edit as a creation tool for, for people was way ahead of its time. Like now we have things like Roblox and uh, Godot and there are entire studios being developed around the concept of providing tools to players to make their own stuff uh, like Core. Um, I think most of them are failing to do a good job of providing tools that are easy enough to use. I think Warcraft did a really good job with the trigger editor, making it simple to sort of visually see how things are laid out and teach logic. To make a Roblox map, you literally need to learn Lua scripting. <laughs> That's not very friendly at all. My daughter loves Roblox so much, I tried to get her interested in developing uh, games with it and you flat out have to learn Lua and that's kind of tough though I did start her with like Code Academy and, and, and things like that but those things get boring quickly because once you get the basic concept it just gets repetitive and you're like what am I really doing because you're not learning applicable skills in those sort of training situations or at least you don't understand that they're applicable skills yet. So Dota was appealing because RTSs are hard for most people they like controlling units and like casting spells and stuff and Warcraft 3 was bridging this gap between classic RTSs where you're massing units and sending them at the opponent and like trying to micromanage the individual units in a battle. And then we had this hero unit who had spells that he could cast. With Warcraft 3, you'll notice that the mana costs are very high and you have very low mana and they it doesn't regen very quickly. So you're casting one, two, three spells and then your hero's kind of done unless you can find a mana potion or something. What made Dota so appealing was that it was like, yeah, it's the use of these abilities on this one hero unit that makes it so compelling. So you increase their mana pool and their mana regeneration and so they're casting spells more often and it's like when do I use this ability uh, in this combat to, to be most effective and what made it compelling was that you're just controlling one unit now but you've still got sort of the feeling of the action of the RTS 
in that that one unit does so many things. It just was the first to sort of capitalize on that. The aspect of the RTS being sort of a three-fourths top-down kind of view and controlling a unit, clicking it around on a map and using uh, multiple abilities on that unit in, in the best way possible to defeat your opponent. It invented a new genre and that's freaking amazing. That came from user-made maps. Why don't more studios make user-made maps? Well, they are now. <laughs> that's what that's what Roblox is. That's what Core is. That's what several studios are doing. But I I don't think they're focusing on their tools the way they should be. How did you start your game development career? What was your first game you worked on and your memories of your early development experiences? Uh, I started in Quality Assurance. I do have an origin video for this to, to see how I got into it exactly, but I'll skip to being in QA. The first game I did Quality Assurance for was Diablo for the Macintosh. It was a lot of fun because back then it was like, you know, play the game and find bugs. Quality Assurance when I started was not as methodical as it is now, where there's a bunch of checklists and burn down sheets. And it was more about, can you do something creative enough to find a bug? And that was what I enjoyed because I you know, I found all sorts of crazy bugs that way. I think it was Joe Frain who found the crotch bow. Basically you could get it where the Amazon would shoot arrows out of her crotch as opposed to the bow, which we all thought was hilarious because we were all, you know, 18, 19 years old. <laughs> My early days in QA were great because you clocked in and clocked out. So there was no overtime or anything like that unless it was paid. But you know, I was making like $8 an hour. So it's not exactly like an amazing kind of pay. But then we would all go to lunch together and we'd talk about games. And it was, well, since everyone at Blizzard loved games, we all had this instant camaraderie and it was just a really good time. And I really enjoyed the early years there. In terms of the first game I worked on in a non-QA role, uh, it was StarCraft for the N64. I made the cooperative campaign mission and I wrote the story for it, though there's some contention about who wrote that story now. The idea of infested Stukov and a co-op campaign mission that primarily came from me as far as I recall. And I worked on that mission with Christian Arechi. He was a really good, he was really good at layout. So he did the layout of the areas and then I did all the campaign triggers for the cooperative uh, aspects, which were actually quite difficult because first of all, you're using an N64 controller. I knew that they would be using it. So I had to sort of keep in mind what units I should give and how to keep it within certain constraints. But yeah, it was really fun. What is your proudest achievement in development? My proudest achievement? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I guess it's all the people that I've reached. Like, I, I don't really take pride in any individual thing that I've done on any of my missions or any of the games I've worked on. For uh, Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, there's a, a sniper character and I created a script for how that sniper character works, where his first shot is almost, it's like close, but it's gonna miss. <clears throat> so it sort of alerts you that there's a sniper there and then you can turn and fight with him. And then I put some triggers around him so that if you used a certain shot it, and he got knocked unconscious, he would one shot get flung out and it would fling the his money and stuff out too to sort of safety it for the player. And I was really proud of that <clears throat> back then because it's one of those things where I took into consideration how a player feels and, and what that experience is like when you're dealing with snipers and i was proud of that in terms of like coming up with that and it got uh, other uh, designers on odd world strangers wrath saw what i had done with that and they were like oh yeah i just took that and copied it because it was so good so i, I was pretty proud of that the person who told me that was gautam babar who went on to, he's at valve so that was cool. I think the most humbling thing has been the number of people who have reached out to me now in light of like learning who I am and what I did and going, oh my God, Warcraft 3 and some of the missions that you did was what made me want to go into game development. That's so freaking cool. <laughs> like, What more could I hope to achieve than to sort of usher in the, a new generation of game developers and game designers who learn from my missions what they like about games and, and, and creating their own. I inspired other people to create. That's amazing. So I couldn't be more proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> Get choked up. What is your least proud moment in development? So my least proud moment in terms of like content that I created, it's usually the things that I don't have control over that make me unhappy. For example, I worked on the Da Vinci Code game for the PC and I designed the majority of the puzzles. I designed a lot of the levels. I wrote almost the entirety of the script and most of the in-game dialogue. And all of that ruined because the owner of the studio decided that it had to have combat, which doesn't make any sense. It should have been a classic adventure game and it could have been a really cool one with like some stealth elements and, and whatnot. And it just got ruined because some guy decided that Robert Langford had to fight cops. <laughs> it's just stupid. 
it's so stupid. So I'm proud of my work on it. I am unhappy with the result. It's my lowest rated game, like it's 74 or something on Metacritic. And so it's sort of this combination of, I'm proud of what I did, but damn, the end result was so crap because of one stupid decision. That's why it's so important to sort of know who you're working with. Like when you go to a new game studio, you wanna make sure that you're working with people who are of like mind and aren't in a position of power to make really stupid decisions. So lately I've noticed that as soon as I find someone who is in control and makes dumb decisions, I leave <laughs> because I, I know what's going to happen. They're going to do something stupid and ruin what could have been good. That is the most disappointment I've ever had in my career is when I do really good work and then it's ruined by one or two dumb, dumb, dumb decisions that are out of my control. Disregarding technological and economic limits, if you would have a chance to develop any game, what would you work on? You know, there aren't really any technological or economic limits stopping me from making whatever I really want to at this point. I think what's stopping Stopping me is that there are so many things that I want to do that I almost am relying on other people to direct my attention to what I should do. Because I want to make a cool RPG, I want to make a really cool detective game, I want to make a really cool open world exploration game, like there's all these things that I want to do. But the truth of game development is that you need other people who also want to do the same thing. So I'm kind of looking for groups that I can go with and do the cool things that I want to do within the the framework of them also wanting to do cool things in that same sort of setting or gameplay dynamic or whatever the case may be. And that's kind of why I'm involved in so many projects at once right now, though I think it's a little a few too many. When I was younger, I would have said flat out like a JRPG style RPG, like a full blown story driven RPG. I'm not sure that's true anymore. The thing I'm jonesing to make is like a tactics RPG. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping to get an opportunity to do that soon. And I think I found an opportunity for it, but we'll see. But yeah, because there's so many things I want to do, I kind of rely on finding the right people to work with on those ideas. And that's actually the most difficult part is finding people you, who you have real synergy with. I hate using that word, but it's it's the only way to describe it. Finding that team that you can work really well with and, and build off of each other as opposed to like people tearing each other down. Where do you see RTSs like Warcraft 3 or Starcraft 2 in a few years? Well, I mean, War 3 and Starcraft 2 are going to be mainstays of the RTS genre for eternity. I don't think they're ever really going away at this point. But do you mean where do I see RTS as a genre in a few years? I think there's a coming revitalization. I see a lot of things being worked on in the background, most of which I can't discuss. But I mean, like Frost Giant is a good example. They've basically promised to evolve the RTS. So I see the RPG aspects coming up more and being more well-defined because I think that Dota sort of proved that the having a really powerful hero is, is super exciting exciting and something you want to focus on. And then maybe Mo O'Brien's original vision of, of what Warcraft 3 should have been, maybe that comes to pass where you have a main uh, hero leading the charge and you're using the abilities and focusing on that and then the units sort of operate in a smart way around them. The strategic elements are still there because you're building that army, but you don't necessarily have to control them directly, but maybe you can take over. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to go, and I think we'll see a number of iterations on that in the near, in the next two to three years. I think we'll definitely see a lot of RTSs coming back into the limelight. And then who knows, maybe if someone finds the right way to monetize that and actually makes billions of dollars, then maybe uh, you'll see a Warcraft 4, but I still highly doubt that. Were there any core design principles or goals you had when designing each mission? Yeah, it's it's the basic core design principles of all game making, which is to think about the user experience. What is the player experiencing here? How can I show the player where to go, leading the player's eye, and like what interesting things would be happening here? What's going on in the game lore? What should be occurring in, in these situations? It's basically the whole user experience. And that's, that's what I was focused on whenever I was designing a mission. What story am I telling? How do I tell that story to the player in a way that they understand it? And how do I turn that into an experience? where they're experiencing the story rather than me telling them the story. Avoiding exposition, uh, which a lot of games are really bad at these days. Yeah, the core design principle is always, what is the user experience and how can I improve it? What is your fondest memory of working on Warcraft 3? Does anything stand out that makes you nostalgic? Of the actual work? <laughs> you know, the work itself kind of sucked. 
let's let's be real like these were grueling hours there was at least two occasions where i spent the night there because i had to finish a mission before the next day so that it could be tested in time that is not the right way to do things because when you're operating on so little sleep your brain stops functioning and you're just not coming up with good solutions in, in terms of nostalgia for working at blizzard like nothing comes to mind like i don't have any nostalgia for that time period i have nostalgia for the things i created but the work environment not a damn thing. The work environment was something I tolerated so that I could create cool stuff. <laughs> Which is a terrible way to think about it, but I mean, that's basically what it was. When I run into a bad work environment now, I'm just like, see ya, I'm out. <laughs> and so I say no to a lot of stuff that others might think me crazy for, but you know, my mental health and well being is more important than working on the next killer game. And when they say killer game, they mean they're gonna, they would literally kill every freaking person working at the studio if it meant the game would <laughs> be better and they will try like i'm watching you cdpr <laughs> i know what you're about uh i had a interview with remedy that kind of put me off them recently and you get a bunch of these studios they get big and they they make cool games and they make, make millions of dollars and like well why wouldn't everyone want to work for us we're so cool so we can offer you lower wages and we can offer you extended work hours for no extra pay and get away with it screw that uh, I don't need to do that, and nobody should uh, tolerate that. Nobody. I don't care if you want to be in games and you haven't gotten your opportunity yet. Don't accept it. Just don't. Walk out. Unionize. Strike. Because if you don't, you get abused. And no one should tolerate abuse. Ever. So yeah, my fondest memory of working on Warcraft 3 is actually seeing people experience joy as they play my missions and hearing the stories of people having played Warcraft 3 and deciding to, to make game design a career. And like, those are the things that um, I fondly remember now. And these are new memories and that's makes it even cooler. In terms of nostalgia, looking through the map editor, I have some nostalgia for the, the creation aspects of it and creating the missions and the tools that I had, but beyond that, not much. And that's it. Yeah, that's the end. So there's uh, no more questions from the original ask me anything that I can answer myself anymore. The answers that I give would be unsatisfactory because I don't have personal knowledge of like what Metzen was thinking when he wrote this or or what Sammy was thinking when he created some piece of art. There's just no way for me to answer those questions in a satisfactory way. And I don't want to speculate too much because the point of this whole thing is to give you real answers. That said, I believe we will have at least one person from the original team uh, answering more questions. So I'm looking forward to that. In terms of what I'm going to do next, I'm thinking that maybe I'm gonna do a live stream and maybe I'm gonna open up the map editor and step through all the triggers of my missions. And maybe from that, there will be a series that spawns of me sort of explaining how I did all the different triggers and going through the thought process and sort of explaining the design and the and the user experience sort of methodology that I that I had when I was making them. And if that would be interesting to you, it would be much appreciated if you like and subscribe and spread this around to other people who might be interested in that. Anyone who you think is an aspiring game designer, please bring them into my channel. <laughs> show them my YouTube videos, show them Game Design 101. If you have kids who are thinking about games as a career, show them Game Design 101 because I think that that's a really good intro uh, and I'm getting a lot of positive feedback I don't have time right now, <clears throat> but I will be continuing the Game Design 101 series soon, TM. So that's it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, latest Warcraft AMA. I may or may not be part of the series uh, as it continues forward. It really depends. It may turn out that certain developers just have no time or they need someone to ask them the questions or maybe it becomes a phone interview. I'm trying whatever it takes. I'm going to try and get this series done. Just, you know. Enjoy this nostalgia while you can. Uh, I, in July, I think celebrating the 20th anniversary of Warcraft 3's release, I think that will be where I do a final video and we'll all say a, a tearful farewell. But uh, that is in the future. We don't have to worry about it now. So uh, like and subscribe and have a good day.